Well, this morning I want to pump you up. I want to fire you up. I got some Navy SEAL sayings for life. That's my message this morning. And, you know, there's some things I learned there that are good for just about anybody. And uh, this is many years ago. And those sayings that I learned and the training I went through for about six months, I didn't uh, graduate from the SEAL training. I broke my femur. And uh, during that six months that I was recuperating, God called me into the ministry, and I, I decided to go a different direction. But it was a time in my life where I learned some things. And as a 17, 18-year-old man, I, I found that these sayings have many times come back to my mind and helped me through tough times. And uh, I was watching Admiral McRaven. He was uh, on the uh, YouTube, and he was talking about how to make your bed. Anybody ever see that video? And uh, there's a book called How to Make Your Bed Now. Uh, many of you probably need to read that, some of you fellows. Amen. No amens to that. All right. Some of you wives ought to say amen. <laughs> Martin Luther never made his bed for like 40 years. He, his wife, uh, Catherine von Bora, when they, when they finally, they smuggled a couple nuns out of a nunnery. And they found wife, husbands for all these nuns, you know. And uh, there was one, she wasn't really the prettiest of the bunch. And her name was Catherine von Bora. And uh, one of his mentors said, uh, you've been preaching about the bishop being the husband of one wife, Luther. Why don't you... Uh, marry this woman. So he did. He married her for, you know, for mostly for doctrinal reasons. But uh, he fell in love with this woman. But when she went and looked at his bed, it was a, like a pigsty. It smelled in the stench. And she said, there's no way I'll ever live with you like this. So she had to basically throw the whole bed out of the house. It was that bad. And so thank God for you women. Amen. And this Admiral McRaven, he, uh, before the University of Texas, talked about some of the principles of just making your bed that can help you through life. And it became a New York Times bestseller. And uh, I won't talk about how to make a bed this morning because I was pretty bad at it. I'm still pretty bad at it. Uh, in fact, in boot camp, uh, the, the instructors would come by and run their hand along the sheet and they would find a catch edge if you didn't fold your sheet right. And they called me Catch Edge Keo because I always seemed to do it backward. I don't know, what, it must have been a kind of a bed dyslexia of sorts. I don't know, I couldn't seem to get the sheet going the right way, and uh, so I'd always be standing and, you know, in position, you know, running in place in front of the instructor's office there until my belt buckle uh, seemed to shake my belt out of my pants for about an hour. You ever run in place for an hour with your arms in front of you? That's pretty tiring. And uh, I was, tried to be the flag bearer in boot camp uh, to go to the, take the guys down to the uh, religious services, and uh, I had such a bad mouth, they said, you can't have that job anymore. You know, you're supposed to be leading the men to the church. And so I have a lot in common with Pastor Bemis. If you listen to his stories, very similar. He ran one time, and he, didn't ha he left his belt. He forgot his belt, and they said, Bemis, run back and get your belt. And so he ran back, and his T-shirt got all dirty and black, and his hat was black, and he came back, and he said, you failed. And he said, uh, now you say pig, and you, you say... Uh, what does it say? Oink, oink, oink. Get in the back of the ranks and you go around for about a week. He had to do, uh, say oink, oink, oink everywhere they went. Uh, so uh, we had some similarities in, in our experiences in life. And it was in boot camp I got saved. And it was shortly after he got out of boot camp that some Methodist out on the street gave him a gospel tract on and Broadway down in San Diego. That's where I first started going to the serviceman center myself. And uh, the Lord worked in my life in the U.S. Navy and got a hold of my heart. And it was while I was out in San Diego, I went to the Naval Amphibious Base. And I went to the uh, BUDS training, uh, that's SEAL training, Basic Underwater Demolition. SEAL stands for Sea, Air, Land. And they try to, you know, be able to do covert operations anywhere at any time and around the world. And they do a very good job of that. They're the mo most elite force probably in the world. And to become so elite, you have to have some kind of principles. And uh, these principles, although I'm not going to be probably preaching a lot out of the Bible, have helped me. And it can help you. And these are some good principles in life. The Navy SEALs, they do a lot of destruction with, with very little visibility. It takes a few men. Their, uh, one platoon of Navy SEALs, a team of 16 men, has more firepower than 100 in, uh, in a division. 100 men. They have more power than 16 men. Why? Because they're one unit. They work together as a team. And they call them the Navy team. SEAL teams. 
and they have SEAL Teams uh, 1, 3, and 5, and 2, 4, and 6, and they're very specific in their job, and they go in and they do a lot of saboteur, sabotage, they do a lot of destructive work, blowing things up, why? To save lives. It seems like a destructive thing, and it seems like a terrible job to be in special warfare, but their ultimate goal is to preserve life and to save lives and to take out bad actors, terrorists, characters are out there that would harm other people and do evil things in this world. I've learned some things in life. I learned from my dad. He taught me the work ethic uh, of a steel mill worker raising eight children. I thank God for him. I, I learned a lot from Dr. Ruckman, who learned from Bob Jones Sr. and a lot of that wisdom over the years. And I've I've, I've thanked the Lord for good people he put in my life. Amen? And uh, you ought to be thankful for those that give to you. You ought not remember when you give, but you ought to be remembering when you take. Amen? And when people helped you along the way. And there's been plenty of people help you along the way. And the Navy SEALs, to get to that elite level where they are able to work as one unit. You know, they've never had a man taken captive in all the years that they've been uh, doing covert activity around the world. They've never had a man taken captive. They've never had a man surrender. And they've never left a man behind. That takes character. To be willing to lay down your lives man for man. To be able to uh, be part of a unit. And I learned some things there about being able to be part of that. Being willing to give of yourself. They have one saying it's, Give, uh, you're either going to do one of three things. Give up, give in, or give all. <laughs> that's, that's life, amen? You're facing troubles right now, every one of you, to quit, to give in, to surrender, to give up, throw in the towel, or you can give your all to Jesus. And I learned that with that, with that uh, time that I spent there for six months. There was a no-quit attitude. There were a lot of quitters. I started in class 130, I started in class 128, was rolled back into another class because of bursitis, and I had a femur that was actually fractured and didn't know what I was running on it, popping Motrin, trying to, you know, get rid of the pain. And uh, they rolled me into class 132, and I went through uh, first phase and second th phase, and, and then the third phase of this training. They have a week in that called Hell Week, where about six and a half days, you don't sleep, and you do continual exercises. We call them evolutions. You go from one evolution to the next. And they're not just playing tiddlywinks. You're, ra you're rafting a boat five miles around Coronado Island. You're swimming a mile. You're running a five-mile timed run on soft sand. They make you wet all day long. You're running with sand in your crotch and in your neck. Every area that's rubbing on your clothing turns to sandpaper. And your flesh turns to just red, rashed, uh, it turns to yellow pus. And you're that way for a week. And it takes a determination. The Navy SEALs, they have a, a, a certain fearlessness. A certain decisiveness has to be in that individual. A certain, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, just sold out. Sold out. Given over to that. To say, I will not ring that bell. There's a bell there in, the, in what they call the grinder where they, would, they will try all during that six months training to get you to ring that bell, to quit. The devil wants you to ring the bell. The devil wants you to throw in the towel. And uh, one of their sayings is all in all the time. All in all the time. And you can't do it all day long. You've got to do it for that one evolution. One thing we learned is you can't do it all at once. You've got to do it one little bit at a time. You can't get through a whole week of hell week all at once. I remember the first day on a Sunday afternoon. It starts on a Sunday afternoon and it ends on a Saturday evening. And on that Saturday afternoon, they came in with blanks and an M60 and they were shooting. They were throwing percussion grenades and they were throwing smoke uh, grenades and uh, things that caused a chaotic scenario. And they grounded us up and were spraying hoses in our face. And we had a boat over our head. And uh, we had uh, rafts. We had our, you know, our K-Pox. We had our life vests in there, they were spraying water inside the boats and they had paddles in there and other equipment and you're holding that thing up over your head. I don't know if you ever hold your hand up just for a minute over your head, try that. And your arms start to get tired. I mean, in this body of mine, I have a beautiful body underneath all this fat. So I'm like a bronze god. <laughs> 
But you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> but one, one time, amen, brother. <laughs> and and I was, we were holding that boat up, and it, we just got in the grinder, and they're spraying water in your face. And you're already hearing that bell within 20 minutes. Bing, bing, bing. And we started with 140 men in that class, 132. It was a winter class that'd make you stay out in the ocean in February until some of the guys' eyeballs would roll back in their head and they'd go into hyperthermia. Pull them out and put them in the ambulance and run them down to Balboa Hospital. They'd uh, make you do drown proofing, tying your hands behind your back and your feet together and make you swim in the ocean and lay you on steel barges all night long and your body just shivering and uncontrollable. And I'd do something, I'd say something nasty to one of the instructors so they'd get mad at you and make you do push-ups. And I'd say, oh, thank God, do some push-ups just to warm up. And I'm standing underneath that boat and they're spraying water in your face and calling you every name in the book. And my mind started hearing them bells ringing, bing, bing, bing. And I never quit anything in my life. I mean, I've never been a quitter. My dad taught me never be a quitter, but my mind started thinking this. This is just Sunday afternoon. This is Sunday evening. How, we, how am I going to go a whole week of this? How am I going to make it through a whole seven days of this? There's no way. I'm so weak right now. My arms are burning. And I'm, you know, they have another saying. It's if you're not cheating, you're not trying, you know. So I started cheating a little bit, you know. And they'd come over and yell at you. Get up boat, up boat, you know. Put the boat up. Man, this is 10 minutes in this thing. Guys are leaving our boat crew and the boat, boat's falling and they reshape boat crews and there's already 10 guys gone. Bing, bing, bing. I was just said, hey, quit. I was, I, I was just getting overwhelmed. And about that moment, they said, down boat. And I put the boat down and, and something came over my They said, get wet. And you run over the ocean, you run up over a berm and you jump in the ocean and then they say, make yourself a sugar cookie. And then you roll around in the sand. You're totally covered with sugar, you know, white sand of San Diego. The, it's called the Silver Strand. And my mind said, I can do this. I made it through one. I can go to the next one. Christian, you're, you get overwhelmed at times in life. And you start looking at, I can't make it. I can't make it through this week. I can't make it through this month. I can't make it through this year. God doesn't say, keep looking down a year from now. You can do the one exercise that God gave you for right now. That is in one of my sayings. I don't know how I got on that. But only 15% of those who try for this training make it, eventually make it to the teams. And I've been saved now, I don't know, 40 years or so. And I'd say that the, the odds of you making it as a Christian are about just about less than that even. I've seen Christians come and go, and how many of them I've seen just come and sit in church and be there for a while, and then they quit. They get overwhelmed with life and the cares of this world, the Bible says, and the deceitfulness of riches. Christian, you need to have something in you and some sayings that will be repeated in your mind, some scripture that will carry you through the battles of life. you got to have some grit. Nowadays, we have such a thin-skinned, offended Christians around and the world around us. You can't speak your mind anymore, but I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm going to stay with the old paths. I'm going to speak my mind whether they like it or not. Whether they throw you in jail or not, we're going to keep church open. We're going to preach the old path. We're going to stay with the old book and stay with the old sayings that create an elite group of people. It may not be great in number like the Gideons. Maybe it'll be whittled down to 15% of those that started. We started with 140 men and graduated. They graduated. I was number 20. I was, a, I was 20 that left, of the number 20 that left. I didn't leave. They just rolled me out because I had a broken femur. They graduated 16 men out of 114, out of 140. Imagine that. I don't even, that's pretty hard to believe, amen? And I'm telling you that Christians today, they, if you make it a year, you're doing pretty good. If you got baptized and you're in a good Bible-believing church, if you're here after five years, praise God. If you haven't faltered and failed and quit on the Lord and rang the bell yet after 10 years, praise God, that's a victory. Stay in the battle, brother. Because there's a lot that have fallen. You know how many women have graduated from the Navy Bud SEAL training program? They're eligible since 2015. Zero. Amen. That should be that way. Amen. It's not a place for women. When, when a woman graduates from Navy SEALs, Jesus is coming back. <laughs> Amen. I wouldn't want, we were butt naked out there on that beach with 
60, 70 men huddling in February trying to stay warm one against another. They did things that were just, I wouldn't want a woman to go through. <laughs> Debasing, disgusting, just to desensitize you. A woman should be sensitive, amen? A man who wants to go to war, a man who needs to be in a battle, is supposed to be desensitized. We'd see, sing songs that were pretty crude, pretty rude to desensitize the mind. That's what you get in the military. I really don't want women to be in our military to be desensitized. I want men to go to war and be willing to protect their women. Amen. I know there's women in the military. I appreciate their willingness to serve. But I think that's a policy problem in America today. I think that men should fight the battles. Men should go lay their lives down for their women. Amen. Call me old-fashioned. I offended somebody right there. Amen. So be it. You can be offended. I'm not here to please you. I'm here to preach. The Bible has an order to things. Amen. Men went forth to war. Yeah, there was one woman in the Bible, J.L. She was in her tent, and along came Sisera, and she did a good thing. She, she drove a peg, a tent peg through his temple and nailed him down to the ground. But that's the exception, not the rule, amen? Seals are some bad cats. Why? Because they have some principles. They may not always follow the book. They have another code. They have an unwritten code. And their code is to watch each other's back. That's why not, not one has ever been surrendered in a war situation. Not one has ever been taken captive in war. Because his team members will go in there and lay down their lives. I appreciate that. I appreciate Christians that have each other's back that way. You women may not be able to go. I, you may not go to war, but you're in a war. You're in a greater war. I'll tell you what, when I chose to go into the ministry, I've had, I'll tell you what, that's a harder ministry than being in the Navy SEALs. Serving Jesus Christ is a lot harder than being a Navy SEAL any day. I know that's a fact. Because you've got a greater enemy, Satan. And he wants to tear you down and destroy your life. And he's far more powerful than any power on this earth. He's far more dangerous. And he's had a lot more casualties than any other champion out there. Where am I at? I talked to a brother yesterday. He's mad at God. He quit serving God. He got bitter because things didn't turn out. He's reading books on how to be successful. You're setting yourself up for failure. Let me tell you what, Christian, you're not always going to be successful in this life. You're going to have some bad days. You're going to have some deep valleys. There's going to be some heartbreak and heartbreak. And if you're going to get mad at God because you didn't get what you thought you had coming, then you're going to be sorely disappointed. I talked to that brother. He's got four babies and a beautiful wife. And a healthy family. I said, brother, why do you have, what do you have really to be mad at God? I mean, you got, you're better off than most people in this world, man. You got three, you got four darling little children. Man, what's, what's better riches than that? And I said, I want to talk with you some more. And we're going to get together. And I'm going to help him, encourage him. But you need to have some stick to it. Stick, stick to it, Christian. Every frogman has to be qualified in several fields. You have to train. You have to work hard. It was hard. It was the hardest thing I ever did in my life as far as physically going through those six months of Navy SEAL training. Boy, I mean, they would make you stay underwater and tie knots for something up to two and a half minutes. You have to learn how to control your breath. They call it box breathing. You, you hold your breath. You breathe in four seconds. And you hold it for four seconds. And you breathe out for four seconds. Some of you have anxiety fits. Some of you have, uh, you get... Uh, you get attacks. What do you call that? Anxiety attacks. You ought to try box breathing at work. Calm your heart down. Slow your heart rate down. Then you breathe out for four seconds. And then you empty your lungs and you hold that for four seconds. You might want to try five seconds. So you do a box. Four, 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 four. Just slow your heart rate down. Stay calm in the battle. Christian, there's a lot of people wigging out. <laughs> a lot of people under pressure, they panic. They start blaming things. They start getting out of church and getting out of sorts with God. And then they quit the battle altogether and they quit the team. And they get out of church. This is your team. This is your family. You ought to appreciate them. You ought to have each other's back. Amen. Frogman should learn how to dive. He has to be good and proficient in diving, demolition, parachuting, and weapons. What is diving? Diving is going into a into an element that is not natural for you. Going underwater, breathing underwater, dive physics, dive training, knowing how to remain calm underwater. 
When your hands are tied behind your back and your feet are tied together, it's easy to panic. But you've got to do what's called drown proofing. You've got to learn how to swim like a little bit of a worm. You've got you to just be a mermaid. Work your way up. Grab a little air at the top of it and then go back under the water and just remain calm. And sometimes living the Christian life, walking in the Spirit... You're not, it's not your natural world sometimes walking in the Spirit. You're in the flesh. You're in the world. And it's hard for you to just to learn to be, be still and let God be in control. And you get panicking at work, panicking at home, panicking with the family and with the troubles of life. You've got to learn to be in walk in the Spirit and just say, Lord, help me to stay calm. It's hard, hard to be calm when your hands are tied behind your back. Hard to be calm when your legs are tied together and you're thrown out of your element and you're not a fish. And you've got to hold your breath. You've got to learn to breathe. You've got to learn to breathe in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You've got to learn how to dive and live in that water. It's not a natural place to live. But that's where you've got to live. You've got to learn to live in the Spirit, Christian. You've got to learn to walk and listen to the Holy Spirit and stay peaceful and know that God's in control of your life. Amen. A lot of Christians are failing today. A lot of Christians are worried. Men's hearts failing them for fear. The Bible says it's going to happen in the last days. Men's hearts failing them. It's heart attack time. Amen? We're getting close to heart attack time when Christians are going to fall away. Another thing is learn how to do demolition. We worked with C4 out in the desert. We blew up trucks and cars and bridges, claymore mines, plastic explosives, thermal grenades. We blew things up. We destroyed things. That's what the Navy SEALs are taught to do, saboteurs, bombers, destructive force to go in and mess up the enemy's plans. And Christian, what kind of a destructive force are you to Satan? What kind of a threat are you to the enemy? What have you done to destroy his plans in the lives of innocent people? We as Christians ought to be a threat to the enemy, amen? We ought to be able to have a destructive power through the word of God and prayer and through fellowship and through this church to make a difference in this world that Satan notices it. So they took out another railroad track. They took out another bridge. They took out another communication system that I was setting up so I could make inroads in this world and take control of this world. The church should be an obstacle and a destructive force in the path of Satan's plans. Amen? You ought to learn how to use some demolition. You ought to be able to get before the throne of God and pray and say, God, foul up Satan's plan in this person's life. He's trying to destroy that man and his family. He's trying to destroy that young woman with drugs. He's trying to destroy that young man with sex perversion. He's trying to destroy that family. And God, I want to destroy his works of darkness. And I want to put on the whole armor of God. And I want to learn how to pray. And God, teach me to do something destructive. I want to go out and win souls for Christ and destroy Satan's plan to destroy people in hell. Amen. Amen. You can make a difference, Christian. You can learn how to do some demolition. You can go out there and destroy the plans of our enemy. Being in church is part of that, amen? He doesn't want you here this morning. He doesn't want your children in church. He doesn't want you to raise your children in the fear of the Lord. He doesn't want you reading your Bible and hearing good preaching. I'm here to destroy his plans, amen, and so should you be. Amen, that's why we're here in this world. Satan wants to have his way. Then another thing they do is parachuting. Parachuting is like living by faith. C-130 rolling down the strip, airborne froggy gonna take a little trip. Hook up, you buckle up and shuffle to the door. You jump right out and you count to four. And if my chute don't open wide, I got another one by my side. And if that one should fail me too, look out ground, I'm a coming through. <laughs> I mean, you gotta jump out by faith sometimes. I, didn't, I haven't sung that since I was back in those days. It's in my mind. Drink, 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 drunk, 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 drunk. I could sing these Navy songs all, all day long probably because they were embedded in my heart. And I know you said, what are you singing about drinking? Yeah, we used to have one that's uh, drunk, drink, drunk last night, drunk the night before. Going to get drunk till I can't drink no more. But when I'm drunk, I'm as happy as can I be. I am a member of the Frog family. Well, the Frog family is the best family that ever sailed across the sea. There's a highland frog and a lowland frog, an underwater frog and a gosh darn frog. Can't sing it all, amen. <laughs> Singing glorious, hey, glorious, hey. One keg of beer for the four of us. We'd sing all these songs, you know. They're not all good songs. They're, you know, they're military songs. You know, I have a girl down in Kansas City, all that stuff. 
Well, you know, I mean, you say, well, you're preaching. Well, that's what they're singing today. They're out there on the base, and they're marching and singing songs that you probably don't appreciate. I, you know, I've got a girl. She's a vegetable, and she's got a t her own TV. It's called an EKG, and, you know, a lot of songs we'd sing. You know, it's not appreciated. And it's decent. It's not politically correct. Soldiers are not politically correct. Amen. <laughs> they're out there to learn how to kill. They're out learning how to die, give their, lay their lives down, and it ain't pretty. And it's not a bed of roses. You got to learn to live by faith. You got to jump out. Some Christians like to stay close to home. You get up there in that plane and you look down and you go through dive school and you go through jumping out of planes. You jump out into the, into the bay. I don't know how many feet up there. We're jumping out with our, with our fins on and our, our equipment and you're jumping out of a helo and hitting the bay in San Diego. It's scary. It's scary to live by faith. But you got to do it. If you want to be a frog man, you got to learn how to live by faith. Christian, you got to step out of your element. You got to take a step of faith and say, God, I want to do something for you. I want to do something different. I don't want to be the average, the regular. I want to be the elite. I want to serve you. I want to get in a group of Christians that are going to get a crown. Amen. There's something about that trident with that eagle and that revolver. They wear with pride. You, you might meet a seal, you'd never know it. They don't go braggadociously telling everybody who they are. They just keep a low key, a low profile. One thing to say, keep a low profile. Just do your job. Do it well. There's two ways to do it. Do your job and do it again. Do it right and do it again. Now, one of the things we used to say was the only easy day was yesterday. Uh, the only easy day was yesterday. And Christian... Uh, the Bible says this in Philippians chapter 3. Let's, let's look there. What does that mean? You can't look in the past. You can't worry about the easy days. And listen to me, every day is going to be a hard day, generally. I mean, it's very rare that somebody may be born with a silver spoon in their mouth and everything goes their way and everything is just nice and peaches and cream and bed of roses all through life. Everything... That ain't been my experience. Most people got to fight and work and sweat and bleed and cry and have heartbreak and heartache and get through this thing called life. Amen? It's not easy. I mean, we all want it to be easy. We all try to do what we can to ensure some kind of isolation or, or some kind of a buffer zone around our lives to make everything just perfect and then that all falls apart. Amen? God sees to it that something just some, always comes around and just makes everything just messed up. You, you're going to have, I mean, dandelions, man. I don't care. You can spray your yard a million times and those things just come from nowhere. Uh, you could look at just uh, your teeth. You better brush those things or they're just going to fall out of your face. Just everything falls apart. No matter how you are, hard you try. But there's no easy day. The, the Bible, not the Bible. Well, the Bible says in Philippians 3, Paul says, I forget those things. Look at verse thir uh, 13. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. You got to forget yesterday. The only easy day was yesterday, but you don't have yesterday anymore. You got to face today's obstacles. You got to face today's trials. You can say this pandemic's too much for me. You've been living in the past. That's today. We're living in it now. This is what we got to deal with today, whether you like it or not. You got to face that obstacle. You got that boat on your head and it seems too heavy. And God says, no, it's not too heavy. I'm going to say down boat in just a little bit. But you're going to have to press on a little harder. You're going to have to dig a little deeper. You're going to have to see what you're made of. And I'm trying to get some gold out of you. I'm trying to get some character out of you. Hold it up and do your part and press on and don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give in. Give all. Keep on keeping on. There was a race called the Miracle Mile after it was over. It was called that for it was the first time any man had ever broken the four-minute mile barrier. In fact, it was broken that day by two men in the same race. It was held in 1954 in Vancouver, Canada, and these two men were running. Their names were Roger Bannister and John Landy, and they pushed each other to the brink. That's another thing about the teams. You've got to push each other, and these two men broke that four minute mile and Landy led the race for most of the race until the last stretch 
And there as they approached the, 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 the new world record, Landy decides he wants to see where Bannister's at, so he looks over his shoulder, and at that moment, Bannister ran past him on his other side. And he became the first man to ever break the four-minute barrier of the mile. Why? This man's looking back. You can't keep looking back, Christian. Oh, man, it was better. All oh, those days were great. Paul says, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. Christian, if you're ever going to win the prize and get to the end and get the trident and have some pride at the end of the day and have something to show forth before the Lord someday, you've got to forget the past and look forward to the mark. That guy Landy he looked back for Bannister and he didn't see him because Bannister just flew by him. Robert E. Lee was visiting a lady down in Kentucky after the war and the woman lamented all of her plantation, which is a great plantation, was destroyed by the armies that fought there on her land. Artillery fire, she took them to a big grand oak tree. You ever been down south? They have those live oaks and they have those whispery, whispering like, they have them up here, the witch's beard. Beautiful, and they have those grand old boughs that hang. And this tree had been demolished for all intents and purposes. And she bemoaned to General Lee and just decried all that had, she had suffered by the, the Union, the, the Union armies. And, and she said, look at this tree. And she was looking for consolation from General Lee in all of her loss and all of her suffering. And he said, ma'am, Cut it down, dear madam, and forget the past. <laughs> Some people, you're looking at all that something that somebody did to me. And she was dwelling in the past, dwelling in the suffering, dwelling in the heartache and the heartbreak, and she could never go forward. And General Lee said, cut it down. Christian, there might be something in your life, you keep looking back and thinking about the better years, and now i got to deal with this, and I have this problem in my life. you got to forget the past. you got to press on. We never quit. You couldn't quit. I mean, it was, there, was, uh, there, were t there were nights after night where you didn't sleep. We just pressed on. You got the boat. And you're running with that boat. You're paddling. I remember paddling in the ocean for miles and hours on end. And you begin to hallucinate. I'd see chain link fences. I'd see sharks smacking them. Your mind, after days and days of no sleep, you begin to see things. Will you press on? You press on. Another thing is uh, we would say is mind over matter. Look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. We'd say mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. They say mind over matter, people. They'd always call us that, people, or something else. I can't say what. Fecal matter. All kinds of bad names. Mind over matter, people. If you don't mind, it don't matter. Well, what is that saying? There are things you can do that you never thought possible. There, the obstacle in your life is generally the thoughts of your heart. The thing that's holding you back from having victory is your fear. The thing that's holding you back is your own mental state. We'd say, I can swim. Uh, we'd, we'd boast and say, what can you do? I can swim with a container on my back all the way to the Philippines. <laughs> we'd say things that just, you know, that's crazy. We'd, we'd, yeah, I'm going to try it. <laughs> and you'd do, you'd do things. You'd egg each other on. Say, how far can you go? How deep can you swim? How long can you run? You would press yourself. You would force yourself to do greater. There are things you could do for Jesus Christ that you never thought you could do. If you would just trust God. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's a substance. It's real. Mind over matter. Your mind, the things in your mind are what's causing you, not the obstacles around you. You could overcome any obstacle in your life with God's help. Paul says his grace is sufficient for me. He said God gave me a thorn in the flesh, and Paul embraced the thorn. He said, thank God for the thorn. I used to want to get rid of that thing. Now I praise the Lord, for in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. I will therefore will rather glory in mine infirmities, in my distresses. Amen. Paul says, I, I thank God for it. You know what? It's made me a better man. Mind over matter. Hebrews 11. Are you listening this morning? You have an obstacle in your life. You have something that's keeping you from serving God and doing right. You should say, God, help me to overcome that thing and not be 
beaten by it. I can overcome it. We, could over, we learn to overcome instead of make excuse. A lot of Christians make excuses today why they can't serve God. You know what you need to do? You need to overcome that. Amen. Instead of making an excuse why you can't serve God, why you have a handicap, why you have this problem in your life, why you're too busy for God, instead of making an excuse, say, mind over matter. I believe I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Amen. Amen. You ought to say, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You're a conqueror, Christian, if you let God have the victory. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance. That's something real. Now if you were raised in the Keogh family, we had 10 of us here at the dinner table around Thanksgiving. You did not want to be late when mom said the turkey was on the table. You can come back, and, and when our family got together, I had 53 cousins, and that was years ago. My mother was one of 14 children. If they said that food is on the table, you might come by later and just see the rib cake, you might know, just see the chicken bones and say, faith is the substance of things hoped for. There used to be a turkey here. I could tell. I could see it with my mind's eye. <laughs> you missed out. And, you, you know, there was something there. You could see something great done if you would just say, God, I believe that you could do something through my pitiful life. I'm just nobody. I was just an 18-year-old kid, and I was going and doing things that I never thought I could do. People doubted me. They said, you won't even make it through boot camp. And to get through that six months, God helped me. I used to envision my family at the finish line. God gave me a vision. I used to see my family saying, you can make it, you can make it. Christian, one day we're going to get to heaven. And you're, are you going to make it? Are you going to win some rewards? Are you going to finish your course with joy, like Paul said? Are you going to get a crown from Jesus Christ? You've got to envision with your mind that there is, a, there is something waiting for me. I can press toward the mark for the prize, and I'm going to believe it by faith. Faith is the substance. It's real. It's, it's the victory. Having faith, amen? Faith is the victory. You can overcome Whatever temptation you're going through today, you can get victory. You have a sin in your life, you can get victory. You have a handicap that's keeping you from serving God, you can get victory. You can get victory over that sin or that whatever item it is. It might be some kind of thing that you think you need in your life to get through the day. And it's keeping you from having joy. Amen. You should pray to God and say, God, give me mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. You can desensitize. You say, you know what? I don't need that anymore. Maybe it's cigarettes. Maybe you say, I need a cigarette to calm my nerves. Do you really? That's just your mind. That's your mind telling you, I need this. You don't need that. Amen. Say, I need to have a shot. I need to have a drink, a glass of wine, in the, the day to unwind. You don't need that. You pray about it. There was a man named Johnny Fulton. He was a young man. He was run over by a car at the tender age of three years old. He suffered crushed hips, broken ribs, a fractured skull, and, a fra and fractured compound fractures in both legs. It didn't look like he was going to live, they said. But he fought on. He didn't quit. His mind overcame what the doctor said. In fact, he became a strong man. He grew up. He became a runner, and he ran the half mile in less than two minutes. Johnny Fulton. A man named Walt Davis was totally paralyzed by polio by the age of nine. He did not give up. He didn't quit. And he went on to become the Olympic high jump champion in 1952 stricken by polio at the age of nine. Some of you keep saying, well, when I was a child, this happened to me. Oh, when this, you don't know my past. You don't know my problems. Mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. That's the way I look at it. You can keep making excuses why you're not going to have victory, Christian, until you die, and you'll never have victory. But if you say, I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me, with Jesus Christ, I can do all things through Christ, and I can be a victor. Lou Gehrig was a lanky, lanky, clumsy boy, and the boys in his neighborhood never picked him up on a football team. No one wanted to play baseball with him. Nobody would pick him up for their team. He, you know who he was. He grew up, and he became a Hall of Famer in baseball. And they even have a disease named after him, Lou Gehrig's disease. And he didn't let it stop him. He didn't let the neighborhood kids in, discourage him. Woodrow Wilson became the... 28th president of the United States, he couldn't read until he was 10 years old. There's people with all kinds of handicaps. He didn't let it stop them, amen? 
What's your reason, Christian? A lot of Christians can't serve God today. They got too, too many problems. Preacher here couldn't read, got kicked out of, what, fifth grade? Got kicked out of, how do you get kicked out of fifth grade? He's driving the kids around in this car. He's what, they got, what, how old were you, 16? And he's driving around his fellow classmates, seven and eight-year-olds. He said, Bemis, you can't come to school no more. <laughs> what grade was that? You got kicked out of fifth grade, you were driving your car. <laughs> Quite a character. He went down to Bible school, couldn't spell Bible. We all know that. He spelled it B-I-B-U-L. Had dyslexia, learned how to read the Bible. Dr. Ruckman helped him, lived with him, studied the Bible, became a Bible theologian. Amen. He's got a, as far as I'm concerned, that's a master's degree in Bible. He didn't know how to read. Didn't let him stop him. What's your excuse, Christian? Uh, I won't even begin to tell you all the things that Abraham Lincoln in, endured and went through. How many failures, how many losses, how many obstacles. And he didn't let it stop him until he was successful. Thomas Edison had a mind over matter. No matter what, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to keep on pressing on. I'm going to keep on doing the thing that I need to do until I get to the victory. Don't quit, Christian. Some of you have been thinking about quitting. Some of you want to quit life. Some of you are tired of living. That's what the world and the devil and the flesh will do to you. It'll get you to want to just quit. Lay down, your, lay down your arms. Lay down your weapons. The Navy SEAL never lays down his weapon. He holds on. He fights to the death. He knows that weapon. It's part of him. Don't quit, wrote a man named Greenleaf Whittier. You ever read this poem? Great poem. When things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you are traveling seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When, you, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is strange with, with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure turns about when he might have won if he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out. That silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell just how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you must not quit. That was some real good wisdom there. Amen. Never quit. Press on for Jesus. Thirdly, I'd like to say we had a saying. It, was, it pays to be a winner. They'd say that all the time. It pays to be a winner, people. The guy who won the race got to take a rest. <laughs> He got a reward. But to get that reward, you got to work hard. There's got to be some sweat and hard work. They'd say, in, one of the things they'd say in training was the more sweat and training, the less blood and battle. Pre proper prior preparation prevents pee poor performance. You ever heard that? <laughs> proper prior preparation prevents, I don't want to say the word in the Navy, we'd say it, pee poor performance. You know what keeps you from performing badly? Proper prior preparation. Be ready. Readiness is the, is the battle won. Uh, the, what we did was we trained. We trained over and over. We did all kinds of exercise. Every morning we'd get up, 5 in the morning, exercise for several hours on the grinder. We'd do leg lifts. We'd do uh, all the exercises, squats, walk like a duck around the grinder. You ever do that? I couldn't do it today, man. Try to walk like that all the way around just try to walk like that for a minute and burn your thighs and uh, train, train, train. How do we have an effective elite force in the Navy SEALs? They train every day. They're ready every day. They have, a, they have their weapons ready. They have them in their home. They're ready for a warning order at any moment to go to any island in the world, any country in the world, in the middle of the night, jump on a C-130, and they fly off and they do the job. Christian, are you ready? It pays to be a winner. To be ready to be a winner, you have to, you have to prepare. December 16th, 1944, a crack platoon of 50 men in Lanzareth, Belgium, held off a battalion of over 500 German soldiers. They held them for several days, and a few, and a few history books write about this or note it, but that event gave the Allied forces enough time to mount the defense that won the Battle of the Bulge. And one of those men, his name was Will James, uh, he had many operations after, the, after that war. He had many injuries. 
And he, for four decades, he was basically a man who nobody knew who he was. And he went off into oblivion and died in 1981. He was never awarded much, never given anything for it. But Tip O'Neill, and they recognized him in 1981. And then posthumously, they awarded him the Distinguished Service Cross for extraordinary valor in heroism. You know, uh, Christian, there's a lot of Christians that don't get recognized down here. You may not look like a winner down here. You may do a hard job and nobody sees it. That man there, he fought the battle and we won the Battle of the Bulge in 1944, December 16th. If you ever go over there and you go to, uh, oh, what's that place we visited with the museum? Over in uh, France. And they have, uh, there was December 25th and the Allied forces could not get the supplies they needed. And uh, there was an overcast What's the name of the place? Well, they have a big museum there. In any case, they, uh, they couldn't drop to them the supplies they needed. We were, they were ready. Somebody came over and sent a messenger from the Germans and said, are you ready to quit? And the, and the general said, nuts. And they couldn't translate that for about two days. They didn't understand what nuts meant. <laughs> he said, oh, nuts. And so December 25th, and at midnight, the clouds rolled away. And they were able to airdrop all the supplies and the weapons and the ammunition that the men needed. I can't remember the town in France. But that was a change of the battle. Those men were willing to lay their lives down. They were winners. And you know what? Many of us are free today and Germany and Europe is free because those men who died and laid their lives down, they're gonna, they, they had a reward. They have a, a glory to them. Maybe it wasn't right away recognized, but today I want to recognize that. And there's a battle that we're fighting right now. Some Christians have not been recognized. One day when we get the glory, posthumously, the Lord's going to call up some saints and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You're a winner because you labored and you trained and you worked and you paid the cost. You suffered, you bled for the cause of Christ. A lot of Christians are going to come up empty. One day a preacher and a taxi driver came up to heaven and St. Peter met him at the gate. And uh, the preacher got mad because they gave a greater reward to the taxi driver. And P he went over to Peter, the pastor. He said, I don't like, I don't understand. How could a taxi, a New York City taxi cabbie is going to get better rewards than me? He goes, well, you know, could you say that you always preach powerfully? Well, the truth is, yes, I, people fell asleep on me when I preached many times. He goes, well... That cabbie, no one ever fell asleep on him. And in fact, most people were praying in the back seat when he drove. <laughs> I don't know. That was just funny. I put that in my sermon to keep you awake. <laughs> he pays to be a winner, people. That's what they'd say. What that meant was that you're, you're holding that log and you're doing sit-ups with the telephone pole with six other guys. And there's a reward to the team that keeps on going and does it first. There's a reward at the end of the road. It doesn't seem like it sometimes when you're holding that boat up. It doesn't seem like it when you're pulling that telephone pole over your shoulders and putting it on the ground and picking up those kids' crayons in the classroom and cleaning the board, chalkboard off and having your lesson ready for those children and nobody seems to pay attention and you do the calendar for the church and you, you're doing the bills and you're doing the things that you work for the church and you... You, you, you plan this event, and it seems like you're overlooked, and no one said thanks. It pays to be a winner, people. Amen. What that means is, even if they see you or they don't, press on, and you will succeed eventually. You ever seen that picture of the, the crane trying to eat the frog, and the frog had his legs gripping the crane's throat so he couldn't swallow him? Fight on, amen? That frog finally won. And lastly, I want to say this morning that you're never faster than your slowest man. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9, look there with me. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Oh, we had many sayings, but I'm only picking a few out here this morning. Ecclesiastes. In chapter 4, verse 9 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. You know what? You need other Christians in your life. You're not going to be able to go it alone. 
One thing we learned in the Navy t SEAL team was you never go faster than your slowest man. You're all one unit. You pick each other up. When one falls, you pick them up. You care about one another. You labor one for another. We had what we called swim buddies. Anytime you get in the water, you had one other man with you. He's called your swim buddy. When we were in the Navy, you'd go to town, you always had a buddy with you. Buddy system. And Christian, what you need, some of you need a buddy in the church. Some of you might need to get somebody who will be your prayer partner. Somebody you can get together with and, and go out soul winning together. Encourage one another. I've had plenty of Christians in my life. I look back over my years. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have many swim buddies. We were in those waters and there were times guys were drowning. I, remember I looked up a guy on the internet the other day. It's Frank Hoagland. Instructor Holloway was using a, a bug net and pushing him at the bottom of the pool. And kept pushing him down and finally Hoagland didn't come up. Hoagland was just laying on the bottom of the pole. He drowned. And Holloway jumped in there, pulled Ho Frank Hoagland's body up, limp body, and put it on the side of the pool. And they did CPR and pumped his stomach, and the water came out. And we're all standing around, about 40 of us, watching him resuscitate this man's life. And finally, <laughs> he came back to life. Now he's a congressman in Ohio after 30 years serving on the Navy SEAL team. But I remember Frank Hoagland. And we're all standing around looking at that. And they looked at us and said, nobody says the word to anybody. <laughs> I never said a word until today. Frank Hoagland's alive and well. <laughs> I'm just trying to reach him. I want to call him up and witness to him. Say, God spared your life. But I remember there were times where we had some slow guys out there that were hurting. You didn't leave them behind. You don't leave them behind. We're all one body. The Bible says weep with them that weep and rejoice with them that rejoice. There's some Christians in this church that are lonely. It shouldn't be that way. We get some members in our church that are forgotten. We ought to remember one another in love. We ought to remember we're on the same team. We're not fighting each other. Amen? We're here to lift one another up. We had a fireman's carry. You'd, you'd do a fuck. Come here, Aiden. You, if a man was falling down and quit, come here, Aiden. You're not too heavy. You, come here, son. You do a fireman's carry. Oh. You have to get them like this. And you could run with them like that. You know, it's not too hard to run with a fireman's carry. And you say, we're not going to leave you behind. Get them out of there. And you never leave your man behind. And you, and you don't leave a man in, in the, on his own. And they, they never did. There's no weakest link in that. There's no one that says, oh, he's the weakest link or she's the weakest link. We're all the same. We're all going to succeed together or fail together. With that mentality, the church can do anything. Amen? When we love one another and we don't say, we'll leave you behind because you're not keeping up. Remember Mutual of Omaha? What was his name? Uh, Martin. That old white-haired guy. You always see him in, with a boa constrictor fighting, you know? How many of you ever remember Mutual of Omaha? That was a great program. And that old white-haired man, man, Martin something, he'd, you know, Martin Perkins. That's it. And you'd see him out there with wildest situations. Remember, you'd see the lion would chase after that gazelle or chase after that uh, wildebeest. Why? Because it was weak. And it was left alone. And when these bison, they, get, they leave the little baby or the old, old one alone, those lions jump on it. And Satan looks for the weakest ones in our church. He's like a lion. And what those buffalo do, they surround that baby. And they put their horns out and say, you're not going to get this one. Amen. And what we ought to do when we see a weak one in our church or somebody hurting spiritually is not kick them when they're down. Get around them and, su and support them. Lift them up. Get your horns out and say, Satan, you're not taking this one. We're praying for him. Pray one for another. And lastly, listen, dear sinner, if you're not saved here this morning, Jesus is, will stick closer than a brother. He'll be your best swim buddy you'll ever meet in life. If you're not saved, trust him. He said, no, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And I've heard so many heroin, so many stories of heroism with the Navy SEALs and one, one time there was a grenade, I forgot the man's name, Chris something, and Lutrec, I believe. He and another man were on a rooftop, and 
so they threw a grenade on that rooftop and the young man who was with them, he didn't have any family, he threw himself on that grenade and took the brunt of it and died. And basically they were on both sides of him. And I thought about that story and I thought about Jesus Christ. We were thieves on both sides and Jesus Christ took the grenade for us. If you're not saved here this morning, you're missing out on the best friend, the best team member you could ever have, Jesus Christ. He'll do more for you than anyone else in the world. He'll never leave you behind. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest unto your souls. This morning, uh, thank God for a great Savior. Amen. Let's stand this morning. Let's support one another. Support the weak. Comfort the feeble-minded, the Bible says. Condescend the men of low estate. Be not high-minded. Keep a low profile. Seek to win the prize. Don't ring the bell. Don't quit. You can go a little further. Maybe you're going through something real hard right now, and that evolution seems like you can never finish it. Just finish that one. Don't worry about the next thing tomorrow. Don't worry about the troubles and down the road. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. Just take it day by day, Christian. Yeah, there's tough times going on in America and the world's changing quickly. Put your trust in Jesus. Take some of these sayings to heart. The only easy day was yesterday. You've got to face today and the troubles of tomorrow with the Lord.